Um, welcome everyone, this is um, uh, the fourth annual public lecture at IIIT Delhi and we are delighted to have um, Sagarika Ghosh as our speaker for today. Um, as you know, Sagarika is a well-known journalist and a columnist for Times of India. She's been a journalist for 25 years, so um, it's been a long time and we are really honoured to have someone so senior come and speak to us today. Uh, among other things, Sarika has been a um, um, uh, student at Oxford College as well as Oxford University as well as Stevens College in Delhi, and um, she's been um, also she's she's author of two novels and uh, more recently a book on Indira Gandhi, uh, which is uh, titled Indira Gandhi, India's Most Powerful Politician. So, without further ado, I invite Sarika to share her um, uh, thoughts on the topic today, which is. Uh, personality cults in Indian democracy. Please welcome her. Uh, thank you very much, uh, IIT Delhi, for inviting me. It's delightful to be here. I had no idea about how wonderful your campus was, actually. Uh, when I drove in, I thought, okay, where am I? And then I came in and I suddenly thought, oh my God, this is the Enchanted Garden or something. So it's, it's really beautiful to be here and uh, it's a beautiful campus uh, and uh, a wonderful place to be. So thank you very much, Asin and PK and Pankaj, who's not here. But thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to be here. So I thought I'd talk to you today about democracy and personality cults in Indian politics. Uh, this is basically also related to my book. I've just written a new book on Indira Gandhi. Uh, I know most of you were probably uh, not alive when she died, but uh, I was. And uh, for me, Indira Gandhi's assassination on 21st October 1984 was really a baptism by fire into adulthood. Uh, I was like you, I was a college student, I was in uh, second year. and. Uh, on 31st October 1984, when Indira Gandhi was assassinated by her own Sikh bodyguard, you know, for us it was really as if time stood still. She was this uh, permanent occup uh, occupant of the citadel, the constant presence in the citadel. And suddenly, with her gone, Indira Gandhi assassinated, and that too by her own bodyguard, it was like as if the roof of a house had blown off. And then we kind of. Uh, woke up to the grim reality of the riots that followed. Uh, Delhi was plunged into these horrific anti-Sikh riots, as you know, where almost 3,000 Sikhs were mercilessly butchered. Uh, and uh, again, that was a cruel awakening for all of us into an India which we had been sheltered from. You know, we were these sheltered, cocooned children of the license permit Raj. We lived these very cocooned lives. Uh, we had our bata Hawaii chappals, taking the U special to college, eating our bananda, and leading these very uh, meager uh, lives, listening to our transistor radios, 
and eating five star chocolates. We had very, we had no money. Uh, we had, uh, but we used to have a lot of fun. And we had very cocoon lives. But suddenly, with the death of Indira Gandhi, at least in my life, it became a kind of a sudden awakening, really a baptism by fire into uh, a world which we had only really dimly imagined. And I think everyone who was alive at the time will remember exactly what they were doing when Indira Gandhi was assassinated, right? Everyone remembers who was alive at the time exactly what they were doing when Indira Gandhi was assassinated. We don't remember what we were doing when Sanjay Gandhi was assassinated, or were killed, or Rajiv Gandhi, but when Indira Gandhi was assassinated, everyone remembers exactly what they were doing. If you ask your parents and your grandparents, they'll all remember. Uh, so that was the context of my book. Um, I also was very fascinated by Indira Gandhi because, you know, she wrote the playbook of modern Indian politics. Uh, any leader today who wants to be supremo in government, supremo in his party, supremo in his uh, organization, who wants to decimate his rivals, who wants to reach across to the people in a direct populist embrace, who wants to collide with institutions, collide with the media, collide with the judiciary, collide with the election commission, collide with the parliament, collide with the civil servants. Any leader today who does all this is following the Indira Gandhi playbook. She was the parent of this tendency. So whether it's a Nitish Kumar, whether it's a uh, Jaya Lalita, whether it's uh, MGR, whether it's Mamta Banerjee, whether it's Naveen Patnaik, all these supremo leaders, whether it's Mr. Narendra Modi, they are all consulting the Indira Gandhi playbook. I believe Mr. Narendra Modi is Indira Gandhi's true political heir. You know, he's her non-biological son. <laughs> I don't think she would like it, but I think he is her non-biological son and her true political heir in the way he is creating his own personality cult, which she did. She, Indira Gandhi was Independent India's first personality cult. She was Independent India's first supremo leader, the first Gabang leader, you know, as I said, the Bahubali in Akhadi Sari. That's what she was. And uh, so she really wrote this playbook, this modern in Indian politics playbook that uh, today politicians are following to a T. Uh, so I'll come to that, that, that a little bit later in my in my talk to you. In the beginning, let me start with talking to you a little bit about democracy because this is something that is interesting. Democracy is not very fashionable across the world nowadays. Uh, in 1991, the political analyst Francis Fukuyama, after the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, wrote, this is the end of history. He said, communism is dead. And liberal democracy will now march all over the world. Democracy is the only way that people are going to rule themselves. Liberal democracy is going to be the way to go. But through the world, we now find the assertion of what is called illiberal democracies, anti-system parties, and xenophobic populists are now seizing the political stage. 2016 was a watershed year when Donald Trump acceded to becoming president of the United States. That is when I think we see the high noon of the kind of retreat of liberal democracy. So in the 1930s, the competitor of liberal democracy was uh, fascism. In the 1950s, the competitor of liberal democracy was communism. In the, in, in the 21st century, the competitor of liberal democracy is illiberal democracy. Elected autocrats. Autocrats who have used the ballot box, but who have come to power and who are now leading anti-system parties, anti-system movements. Everything with the system is wrong. Everything with the system is elitist. Everything with the system is corrupt. Down with the system. Down with the current, with the Onsio regime. Down with the current uh, regime at the moment. We are the new system. We are a new revolution. And this revolutionary fervor is happening through democracy. It's happening through the ballot box. So it is through the ballot box that you have these anti-system forces coming in and these autocrats who are using their elected uh, mandates to in fact sidestep democracy and to sidestep uh, institutions and to sidestep uh, liberal democratic institutions. What does liberal democracy mean? Liberal democracy 
at the end of the day means a separation of power, means a separation between judiciary, executive and legislature, means no one is supreme. Liberal democracy means an equality of citizenship. Everyone is equal. No one is more equal than the other. No one group is more equal than the other. No one caste or no one religion is equal uh, is, is more equal than the other. But now you see that through the process of electoral uh, churning, through the process of dem democracy itself, democracy is being undermined. So whether it's a Trump or a Putin or a Xi Jinping or a Orban in Hungary or a Erdogan in Turkey or a Kaczynski in Poland, across the world you have the phenomenon of the elected autocrats. And these elected autocrats are personality cults. In, uh, and they are personality cults who are dependent on their personality to create these autocratic systems. Systems that are not reliant on institutions, systems that are not reliant on liberal democratic institutions, but systems that are reliant entirely on the power of their personality. In Thailand, for example, the tycoon turned populist, uh, Thaksin Sinawatra, became a strongman leader and he, uh, he launched a war on drugs and he was then ousted by the army. Now, in an interesting, uh, in an interesting twist, the middle class, the educated middle class, which Samuel Huntington said in his Clash of Civilization, is known as the vanguard of protecting liberal values, vanguard of protecting liberal democratic institutions. The educated middle class is also slightly now turning illiberal, because as we see in Thailand, when the army ousted Thaksin Sinawatra, the liberal middle class embraced the army. Uh, the liberal middle class completely uh, endorsed the army takeover of, uh, of uh, the state. So, in addition to the illiberal nature of democracy, we have the cult of militarism, the cult of the soldier. Now, while we admire and we, we, we are uh, deeply reverential about the army and the sacrifices of the army, when the army defines nationalism, when the army defines our national identity, when the army begins to define who we are as a nation, then we're no longer a liberal democracy. Because the liberal democracy accepts that it's the civilian who is supreme over the army. It is the civilian force which is supreme over the army. But when the soldier is the definer of nationalism, when the soldier is the definer of national identity, uh, in that case, we have ceased to be actually a liberal democracy. I'll read you some figures from the Pew uh, research, uh, a, Pew, a Pew research, which did a research on, uh, on, on, the, on democratic sentiment and authoritarian sentiment across the world. And it found that countries that, are, that were homogeneous, there's a rebellion against multi-ethnicity and against pluralism, particularly after 9-11, when strong men who rail against Islamic extremism have taken center stage. So, there is, there are, uh, there is a condition of economic downturn. There is the condition of the world after 9/11. There is the condition of the world which is now dealing with mass migration, with the coming of the Turkish people and the Asians and the Africans into European countries. There's a rise of xenophobia, a rise of uh, white supremacy sentiment, and all this is leading to a distrust of democratic institutions and to the endorsement of what we call the strong man or the strong woman. Pew research shows that support for a strong man leader, unchecked by judiciary in parliament, is highest in India. 55% Indians yearn for a strong man at the top. 52% uh, young people endorse military rule in India. Half the population of India overall endorses military rule. In South Africa, only 52% endorse military rule. So the sentiment for military rule, the sentiment for the strong man at the top, creating the strong man at the top, this is a worldwide phenomenon, and I think it exists very much in India as well. Let's now come to uh, democracy in India. So this is the context in which democracy operates. Democracy today is operating at a time when liberal democracy is in retreat all across the world and where you have elected autocrats 
taking power across the world. So it's no surprise that even within India, we have a certain worship of power, the worship of the strong man. You know, in India, we're seduced by power. Why are we seduced by power? We're seduced by power because we feel powerless. We are what we are constantly feeling powerless in our society. Right? If we don't have the power to control our destinies, we don't have the power to control our lives, as if our lives are proceeding without our determination. That we feel powerless, we feel frustrated, we feel that we don't have the power to control the events that are shaping our lives. So amidst powerlessness, frustration and helplessness, we become seduced by demonstrations of power. What is the most uh, popular film we have at this moment? Uh, the most popular film is the Dabang or the Bahubali. You know, I'm sure all of you have seen Bahubali and been thrilled by uh, the god king who, uh, you know, who brings down mountains and who is able to kill armies with his, with his, with his bare hands. So again, yeah, these are demonstrations of power that appeal to us because uh, we are con continually feeling powerless. In the situation where a population is worshipping power, where we worship demonstrations of power and are seduced by power and captivated by power, uh, we are also captivated by, therefore, irrational acts. If someone comes out and does something irrational, to us this is a stupefying demonstration of power because the fact that the person can come out and do something completely irrational, like say 500 rupee notes and 1000 rupee notes are going to be uh, illegal from uh, tomorrow night, the, the fact that a, a, an irrational act can be committed openly and in public is a source of great admiration to us because we think, my goodness, this is really a demonstration of power. This is a demonstration of executive will. This is a demonstration of the supreme man, the strong man, taking a decision. So however irrational in our lives it may be, we admire it because it's a demonstration of power. What are personality cults? Personality cults are people in political power who are able to connect directly with the people. They don't need the medium of the political party. Ours is a liberal democracy, and it's political parties <coughs> that are supposed to compete for votes on the basis of their ideologies. But today what we have is a kind of ideological convergence in India. Everybody's sounding the same. You know, as Arun Shuri said, the BJP sounds like Congress plus cow. So, uh, and, the, and the BJP sounds, and the Congress sounds like the BJP of, of uh, BJP minus cow. So, uh, uh, the, the, there is a kind of ideological convergence between uh, the political parties. And in this kind of ideological convergence, what stands out? The only thing that stands out are personalities. Are personality cults within political parties. So, whether it's a Mamta Banerjee, whether it's Naveen Patnaik, whether it's uh, Jaya Lalita, whether it's, you know, you know all the politi politicians we have, Lalu Yadav, these are all strong men, personality cults. This is Narendra Modi. Many of his policies sound exactly like the Congress Party, but he's the personality cult. Uh, even, well, I mean, Mr. Rahul Gandhi, he's the there. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, but there are, but there are personality cults that dominate our politics because of the fact of ideological convergence. Because when there's no ideology, there is only personality. Nehru was a towering personality cult in his time, but he warned against it. You know, in 1937, in, a, in an article in the Modern Asian Review, he wrote about the so-called Rajkumar, the Rajkumar who dominates our life, the prince, who can turn a crowd with a mere laugh, who can make a crowd, uh, crowd uh, clap with a mere smile. And he warned against this kind of use of personality and use of the power of personality and, uh, uh, and, and, and you know, made, was very introspective about his own cult of personality. Ambedkar, as you know, repeatedly wrote about the cult of heroes and idolatry in India. India is still par excellence the land of idolatry. There is idolatry in religion, 
idolatry in politics, heroes and hero worship is a hard if unfortunate fact in India's political life, wrote Ambedkar. Why is it, he asked, in India do we look for heroes? So while we are worshipping power when liberal democracy is weak, when institutions are weak, we are worshipping heroes and expecting heroes to deliver us from the frustration and helplessness that we feel. Yet, heroes and personality cults are not really good for democracy at all, as I've been saying. Indira Gandhi was the first leader who actually demonstrated that when you become a personality cult, when you become a hero, you in fact fundamentally damage liberal democracy. The first thing that in our maker's view, creates heroes and creates personality cults is the use of satyagraha and unconstitutional methods for protest. He says that once you are a liberal democracy, if you use satyagraha and revolutionary methods, if you're on the street protesting change, if you're on the if you're on a, if you know, if you are on in a public place protesting for change, wanting change, if you're leading some kind of in revolutionary in the direction rather than going by constitutional methods, going by liberal democratic methods, going by parliamentary methods. If you're on the street promoting revolutionary change and wanting to break down the system through anti-democratic means, then that relies entirely on a hero figure and once again leads to personality cults. There's a second danger of, uh, that, uh, that personality cults pose for, for liberal democracy, is that we can place our liberties at the feet of a great man, or trust him with the power to subvert our institutions. In India, bhakti, or what is called devotion or hero worship, plays a part in politics unequaled in magnitude to the part it plays in any other uh, politics in the world. Bhakti in religion, this is Ambedkar, is a road to salvation. But bhakti in politics is a surefire way to degradation and eventuality. So, in fact, naturally we are tending towards bhakti and hero worship, but it is this bhakti and this hero worship which is leading us to degradation. How should we strengthen political democracy, therefore? How should we prevent it from becoming hostage to personality cults? The way we can do it is we have to deepen democracy and make political democracy dependent on social democracy. You see, political democracy without social democracy is meaningless. If you have a society which is steeped in uh, religious, religious fanaticism and casteism and cruelty to women and cruelty <coughs> to uh, minorities and cruelty to the other, you are not going to be able to create a liberal democratic politics can't happen. You have to create a progressive society in order to create a liberal democratic politics. So unless society becomes progressive and unless society becomes, uh, becomes liberal and society becomes socially democratic in terms of questioning superstitions, questioning blind beliefs, questioning caste atrocities, questioning the cruelty on women, questioning the cruelty on the other, questioning the illiberal attitudes we have towards interfaith and intercaste and inter, uh, intercommunity marriages. So unless we move towards a progressive and liberal social democracy, political democracy remains meaningless. And political democracy then will be hostage to heroes, hostage to bhakti, hostage to psychopancy, hostage to the great man, hostage to the strong man, hostage to the Bahubali, simply because socially we are backward. Indira Gandhi, let's now come to a comparison of politicians. Indira Gandhi saw the personality cult as essential to her survival. She created a personality cult because she believed that this was the way she could survive. She destroyed regional leaders uh, after the 1971 war. She was supreme and she was in any case in a position to destroy the leaders. After 1975, when she declared the emergency, 
she uh, literally decimated regional leaders. I mean, within the Congress, anyone who raised his head, off with his head. She uh, employed the Queen of Hearts' famous dictum, Jo bhi sar uthayega, uska sar kaat kiya jayega. So, Indira Gandhi actually decimated uh, liberal democracy through her personality cult. And that is the Indira Gandhi playbook that a lot of uh, politicians still today rely on. The RSS and CPM are cadre-based organizations. They generally do not have personalities. The CPM is supposed to detest personalities. The RSS also detests personalities. Bhakti to puja is seen to be uh, anathema to the Sangu Parivar. But of course, this changed because in 1999, for the first time, you had a personality cult coming out of the Sangu Parivar, which was, of course, Adal Bihari Vajpayee. 1999, he was positive as a man India awaits. Now, this was very new for the BJP Sangh because uh, the Vyakti, the personality cult within the RSS was very new. The same thing is now happening in the uh, CPM. If you look at the kind of uh, personality cult of the Kerala Chief Minister Pinray Vijay, he is bringing out huge ads of himself in newspapers. Uh, there are giant cutouts of Pinray Vijay all, all over Kerala. So there is a personality cult also developing within the CPM. Mr. Narendra Modi's politics is entirely based on the cult of personality. He is, uh, uh, he used the culture of personality very well in his tenure in Gujarat, and he continues to use personality and his unique appeal with the people, because let's face it, Mr. Modi has a unique communication style, a unique ability to connect with people, and he has a unique oratorical skill, and this enables him to create a direct relationship with people in a way that no other politician today can. So he is able to create a kind of direct connect with people. And this results again in a personality cult and in the, uh, in, in the politics surrounding one man. The media is completely complicit in this. You know, the 24 by 7 media needs politicians, it needs personalities, it needs big personalities. There are very interesting articles uh, which you might have read on the politics of seeing. When you actually see something through a political prism, the reason why you're seeing it that way is because the media presents it that way. You know, when you see Amitabh Bachchan and realize you may not be someone who, you, who, who looks 10 feet tall. You see Amitabh Bachchan on screen, he's, he's, he's a towering giant. In the same way, the media projects uh, images of politicians, the social media projects images of politicians, uh, and you know, the last election, of course, Mr. Modi was even seen in Borograph. So uh, there also we saw that there were, there were certain media images of actually politicians who could use media very well and, uh, and use the 24 by 7 mass media very well to project their uh, personalities. So the media itself, the 24 by 7 media itself today is very much about personalities. So when ideology becomes less important, when ideology is non-existent, when ideology sounds exactly the same, somebody is doing Aadhaar, he's also doing Aadhaar, somebody else is doing Manrega, he's also doing Manrega, everybody is doing the same kind of thing. The only thing that matters then is personality. So this is the kind of personality cult of politics we have in India today. I'll talk a little bit now about Indira Gandhi and my book and how this relates to personality cults in democracy. So Indira Gandhi is a fascinating figure for me. Uh, she was someone who, as one of her biographers said about her relationship with her husband, that she loved Piroz Gandhi, but she didn't like him. Indira Gandhi was someone who loved what she didn't like. You know, that was the complexity of her character. She loved what she didn't like. She loved Indian democracy, but she didn't like it. She loved the Indian constitution, but she didn't like it. She loved the Indian press, but she didn't like the Indian press at all. She loved uh, Indian, uh, the, 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 the Indian institutions, but she didn't like them and went out of her way to subvert them. She loved Indian politics, but didn't like Indian politicians and, and, and tried to manipulate them and play the puppeteer. Uh, she loved her son, Sanjay, but then in one level she also perhaps didn't quite like him. She loved her father, Jawaharlal Nehru, but if you read their letters, you'll find that that relationship was not a very warm one. And perhaps at some point, he didn't really quite like him either. 
So she loved what she didn't like, and that was the complexity of Indira Gandhi, and that's what I loved writing about her. And she was someone who was born into a family which was a glittering, exceptional family. Motila Nehru, her grandfather, was India's richest lawyer. And he became India's richest lawyer by sheer dint of hard work. He was a handsome, ebullient, magnetic man. And he created this fantastic home in Allahabad, 42 rooms with a tennis court and a swimming pool and a horse riding ring and a roller skating ring. And she lived in the lap of luxury. The Nehru's were accomplished. They were highly educated. They were very good looking. They were very witty. And to survive and flourish in the Nehru household, you had to be witty and good looking and socially adept and very, uh, very uh, accomplished in whatever you were doing. She, growing up in this accomplished, glittering household, was always a little insecure. Her father, Jawaharlal, was a hero. He was a hero revolutionary. He was a bar at law. He had come back. He was, uh, he was, a, he was a very inspiring figure for her. Her aunt, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, was also an equally accomplished and a very beautiful woman. Her other aunt, Krishna Hathi Singh, also equally beautiful and accomplished. Into this household comes the mother, Kamla Nehru. Beautiful but orthodox, can't speak English, she doesn't have the graces, she doesn't have the airs, she doesn't have the education. And Indira Gandhi's first instinct as a daughter was always to be protective of her mother, to be protective of Kamla Nehru. And this image stayed with her all her life, the protector of the underdog, the protector of someone who was defenseless, the protector of someone who was being attacked by more powerful people. Indira Gandhi, the protector of the underdog, was an image that stayed with her all her life. It was her self-image. The photographs of Indira and Jawaharlal Nehru are shown in black and white, and you see a kind of typical father-son close, a father-daughter close relationship. But when you read the letters, you find that it was not really a very close relationship because there was a lot of hurt and a lot of humiliation, a lot of anger in that relationship. Nehru lavished emotional and intellectual labor on Indira Gandhi. He wrote her letter after letter after letter telling her about uh, the, the great uh, heroes of the world, about history, about social sciences, about the natural sciences, about the great historical figures, about the great histories of the world. He labored emotional and intellectual, uh, uh, intellectually on her. But she was someone who, perhaps in her initial years, was a disappointment. Remember, at the turn of the century, it was very uh, rare to be, the, to be an only child. And she was the eldest child of the eldest child. And the eldest child of the eldest child in those days was expected to be a male child. She was not a male child. She was a female, and she was not athletic. She was weak. She was frail. Nehru detested illness. He hated illness. He saw illness as a sign of moral weakness. And he kept telling her to, you know, do the shishasan and stand on your head and walk and run and swim and horse ride. And she couldn't do any of those things. So he was a little disappointed with her. And her early, her early relationship with gender was interesting because she used to sign her letters to her father as a Hindu boy. Uh, you know, she, and her mother dressed her as a boy. So it was almost as if she was not the girl Indira. She was the girl boy Hindu boy. That was her kind of... Uh, relationship with gender. But she had a very interesting relationship with Jawaharlal Nehru. Nehru never thought of her as, uh, as a visionary enough or brilliant enough to be his successor. I think the people who say that Nehru wanted her to become prime minister after him have not read the documents because there's no evidence of that at all. Nehru was very much into academic brilliance, into being a brilliant reader and a brilliant thinker. Indira Gandhi was not brilliant. You know, she was a very mediocre student in school. She went to <coughs> Shantiniketan and didn't finish. And very famously, she flunked out of Oxford. And this caused shame and anguish for her, and shame and anguish for her father. And it was almost as if, as in a rebellion to her father, she kind of then went and married Firoz Gandhi, who was the polar opposite of her father and who her father did not like. So it was these insecurities and these complex dynamics between father and daughter that made the politician that was Indira. She was someone who was deeply insecure and deeply troubled and deeply anxious about herself. But at the same time, she was an alpha female who wanted to prove almost to her father that she, was, she could be as powerful as him and as much 
of a leader as he was. When she became uh, Prime Minister in 1966, the Congress Party was very different from what it is now. The Congress Party in that time, in 1966, was full of the powerful party bosses. You know, the big satraps <coughs> of the Congress. You had Nijalingappa and uh, Sanjeev Reddy and Kamaraj and Atulia Ghosh and Biju Patnaik. These were the big powerful satraps of the Congress. And they invited Indira Gandhi to be the Prime Minister after Shastri died because they thought she would be like the Queen of England. They would uh, put her up in front and they would rule from behind. But the most independent, the most important date in India, in post-independence history, is 11 January 1966. Can anyone tell me what happened on 11 January 1966? On 11 January 1966, Lal Bahadur Shastri died. Now, Lal Bahadur Shastri was the successor of Jawaharlal Nehru. Nehru had chosen Shastri as his successor. Nehru had delegated his powers to Shastri. Nehru had given his, his stamp of approval on Shastri. It was Lal Bahadur Shastri who had taken up after Nehru, who was the Prime Minister after Nehru. Now, if Shastri hadn't died, and I, and I found this in my book, Indira Gandhi might well have departed from India, then there would be no Nehru Gandhis. She was repeatedly writing to her friend Dorothy Norman in England, saying, I want to leave India, I don't like India, India is not the same anymore, I want to leave. So if Shastri hadn't died, what would have happened to Indian politics is an open question. If Shastri hadn't died, I believe Indira Gandhi would probably have departed from India, have never come back, and we really would not have had a Nehru Gandhi family. But Shastri did die, and the syndicate invited her to become the Prime Minister. Now, why do I call her the most powerful Prime Minister? In my book, I've called her Indira, India's most powerful Prime Minister. Because after taking over as Prime Minister, she wielded power and used power in a way that no politician before her had done. She split the Congress party, as you know. In 1969, Indira Gandhi split the Congress. And she made it entirely about herself and her personality cult. And that was the beginning of the end of the Congress. Because the leaders were decimated, party institutions were decimated, the party organization was decimated. The party leadership within was decimated. It only became about Indira Gandhi. So that happened in 1969 when she split the Congress, took it over, and made it entirely about herself. And that showed what kind of a politician she was. Unlike Rahul Gandhi, she did not have anything given to her on a platter. She did not have the presidency of the Congress offered to her on a platter. She fought for it, and she made it happen through sheer dint of uh, political maneuvering and political strategy. By 1971, Indira Gandhi was unassailable. 1971 war, think about it. The whole world is against India. 10 million refugees are pouring in from East Pakistan. Europe has turned its back on India. United States has turned its back on India. The United States is allied to Pakistan. Because by then, President Nixon wants to reach across to uh, President uh, Mao of China and he wants to use Pakistan to use him to get to China. So the United States is against India. India is completely alone in the world. Indira Gandhi goes to the United States to meet President Nixon to ask for help. But what should I do? Ten million refugees are pouring in. The Pakistan army is slaughtering the East Pakistan people. Please help me. Nixon calls her a bitch. He says, you're a witch. He says Indians are repulsive people. Uh, why do they breed in that country? Uh, they should not, uh, you know, they're so repulsive, they shouldn't even be breeding. Uh, this is all there in this wonderful book by Gary J. Bass. She's humiliated by Nixon. She's completely alone in the world. She comes back to India. 12 December 1971, Pakistan attacks India, attacks the Western frontier. And Indira Gandhi says, thank God they've, given, they've attacked us because now we have reason to go to war. Two days later, completely alone in the world. It's just Indira Gandhi. She, with Generals Manik Shon and Aurora by her side, Indira Gandhi invades East Pakistan. <clears throat> Within 14 days, the war is over. It's never happened in the history of the world. A new country is created in 14 days. In 14 days, Bangladesh is liberated by India. Uh, the Indian Army's conduct is hailed across the world. 
Uh, the Indian Army, can, you know, the United States is fuming. Nixon <coughs> sends the uh, USS Enterprise, the nuclear warship steaming into the Bay of Bengal to terrorize India. But she, she did not step back. She holds a public rally at the Ramlila Maidan, where the fighter jets are circling over her head. And she addresses this rally, even as the enterprise is steaming into the Bay of Bengal, saying, we will not step back. Not by a single step will we retreat. She refuses to retreat. And she fights the war. She wins the war. In 14 days, Bangladesh is created. In 14 days, the country is liberated. And she comes out of there. What happens to Indira Gandhi after the 1971 war? Shakti. Vajpayee calls her Abhinav Chandi Durga. By now she is Durga. Ma Durga. Millions of Indian babies are named after her, named Indira. She rides to the very zenith of power. <coughs> I mean, there you are looking at a personality cult which is uh, never seen before. Not even Nehru had this kind of personality cult, where a woman politician is likened to a goddess. So she goes to the very zenith of political power. But within just three years, from the zenith of political power, she slips to the very nadir, when in 1975, she declares the emergency. So the story of Indira Gandhi is one of incredible highs and terrible lows. And the in emergency, as you know, that was the personality cult at its highest. The press was muzzled. The judiciary was uh, subdued. The civil service was made entirely subordinate to the uh, prime minister's office. It was one woman show entirely. And of course, you had the possible Turkman gate, here some clearances, and the notorious note, uh, Sorry, not Nodbandi, <laughs> Nasbandi, uh, Nasbandi Drive, which is of course the possible sterilization. So you saw the very same voter who raised Indira Gandhi to the very height of, the, of being a goddess. She then, from that very same voter, she snatched away democratic rights. But I call Indira Gandhi a half-hearted dictator. Why do I call her a half-hearted dictator? I call her a half-hearted dictator because she imposed the emergency but also revoked the emergency. So, paradoxically, Indian democracy was strengthened. Paradoxically, voters understood the power of the vote. Paradoxically, the one thing she had snatched away from Indian people was the power of democracy. And it's the one thing that people realized when she finally called elections in 1977 and she was routed. So you had the, the leader who controlled the party, controlled the government, controlled the news, controlled the civil service, controlled the arms of government, controlled every institution, controlled all public life. But it was the armed Indian army with his little vote who brought down this all-powerful leader. And by submitting to the power of the vote, by submitting to the power of democracy in action, she actually, paradoxically, reaffirmed the power of democracy. So, when she lost election and she, uh, she surrendered power, democracy won. So, in that sense, Indira Gandhi was a half-hearted dictator. She lost everything. She lost her home. She lost her, her official trappings. She lost everything that... She had a hat for 22 years. She was completely cast out. But I'll give you two anecdotes and then I'll conclude. Uh, the tenacious fighting spirit and courage of Indira Gandhi was always to, to the fore. After she lost, she had nothing. She had no home. She had no car. She had nothing. She had nothing to call her own. Unlike politicians of today, who, when they get thrown out of power, they still get their bungalows and their cars. She didn't have anything. She only had uh, her father's book royalties, and she lived in a house which was vacated for her by a friend. And she used to make it a point to go to every official function she was invited to. And one such official function was the British <coughs> High Commissioner's dinner. To, she was invited to her friend Pupul Jaikar. And she went for that dinner. And when she went for the dinner, people were talking to her. But as soon as the new Prime Minister, Murarji Desai, came in, everyone ignored her and ran towards Murarji Desai. And Pupul Jaikar said, listen, let's go from here. 
you're being humiliated, people don't want you to stay here, let's leave, let's not stay here. And she said, no, I will not go. I will not go. I will stay on. I will stay here. I will talk to every person here. I will not go. That was a tenacious fighting spirit of Indira Gandhi. In 1977, this is my last anecdote. Uh, in 1977, Haritans were massacred in the remote town of Belchi in June. She was out of power at the time. No other politician was ready to go to Belchi. But Indira Gandhi reached Belchi by going there first by train, <coughs> then by ambassador car, then by jeep, then by tractor, and finally on an elephant. <coughs> because the road to Belchi was so remote. It was raining, there was a thunderstorm. <coughs> there was no way across the flooded river. The only way across was through an elephant. And the elephant had no howdah. I mean, you know, no, uh, no uh, thing to sit on. So she, at the age of 60, sat bareback on the elephant, digging her nails into the elephant to hang on through a thunderstorm, through a rainstorm, to journey to the people and to make a spectacular gesture of political symbolism. This was Mother India coming to her children. Mother India journeying on an elephant through the flooded waters, through the flooded streets, through the rain and the thunderstorm. The 60-year-old woman on her elephant, barebacked, went to the people. So that was a personality cult to the fore. Of course, as you know, within two years of being defeated, by, um, by 1980, she was backed with a thumping majority, the two-thirds majority in 1980. So when I put this to Mr. Chidambaram at my book launch in Delhi, I said, look at this, the government should learn from Indira Gandhi. How she, when she lost in 1977, how she was able to, uh, she was able to get her act together and come back in a fantastic victory just two and a half years later. <coughs> And Mr. Chidambaram very mournfully thought about it and said, yes, but Indira Gandhi was fighting Muraji. They said, we are fighting Mr. Modi. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a no contest. So, uh, so that, was, uh, that was Indira Gandhi and the kind of fighting spirit she had. Her final years were blighted by, as you know, by Operation Blue Star, when she sent in the army to the Golden Temple. And I found in the documents that the minute she sent the army to the Golden Temple, she knew that she was about to die. She knew that she had signed her death warrant. And she knew that this was a moment when she would actually be her own executioner. And the Golden Temple siege was a monumental disaster. It was a, it was a horrendous mistake. And it was something that Indira Gandhi did which showed that she wasn't her usual canny, shrewd self, but she really was, by the end of her life and by the end of her tenure, unable to turn to terms with the forces that, uh, that were out there. And this, in a way, relates to the weaknesses of the personality cult. The personality cult, sooner or later, gets overtaken by other personality cults. Unless you empower institutions, unless you empower processes, Unless you empower parties, a personality cult is always in self-destruct mode. Because you are a disruptor, but you're a disruptor from the top. And if you don't create systems, if you don't create processes, then the disruption that you create is ultimately going to backfire. And that's what happened to Indira Gandhi. Uh, so this is the story, in a way, of personality cults in Indira Gandhi, and I think one of the lessons that I learned from uh, from this story and from uh, from uh, exploring her life is the personality cult is seductive. The highs and lows, the tempestuous process of life, is deeply romantic in a way. But in the end, without processes and institutions, a personality cult fundamentally damages liberal democracy and is also on a surefire road to its own self-destruction. Uh, wow. So, uh, that was a wonderful lecture. Two masterclass. I'm still in awe of the uh, eloquent uh, 
narration of, in a way, our 70 years uh, long experiment in democracy. And I, I think there is a there is a tendency, and I think you described it well. We are cocooned as uh, these uh, technology students and uh, teachers of science. Uh, we seen as kind of geeky about things, uh, but this is this is the kind of stuff that uh, I think really matters. Uh, we are, after all, in the capital, the national capital, and these institutions are not very far. Uh, I think uh, this is a great introduction for many of you to now look beyond our little uh, campus here and, and maybe occasionally walk down that pathway and uh, we can the last steps. Uh, but um, before we conclude, let's have a small round of, of question and answers. I have a few questions, but why don't we begin with, uh, with those who, who might have a chance. I will encourage students, no matter how you feel about this subject, I would say go for it for the question. Um, yes. Uh, I think I don't need my Okay. Okay. So, hi. It's a great, great talk, Anika. Thank you. So, just wondering, uh, how your book is different from other books on Gandhi, Indra Gandhi? Ah, oh, that's a very good question. Uh, well, I try to make my book uh, more about. I, I try to talk to your generation of readers and to the younger generation of readers. I try to talk to people who perhaps weren't alive when Indira Gandhi was uh, was killed. I try to talk to people who perhaps would like to have a fresh look at Indira Gandhi. Uh, my book is full of letters, so it has letters to Indira Gandhi and I question her on her various decisions and I question her on her various controversial moves. So I try to create a dialogue between Indira Gandhi and the 21st century reader. So that's how my book is different because I believe I'm looking at her from the point of view of the 21st century and posing questions uh, that a 21st century reader might like to ask. Sagarika, that was a masterful talk. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you, I mean, you spoke of personality cults in Indian democracy, and I tend to agree with you almost entirely. But wouldn't you say, in the same, along the same lines as you call Indira Gandhi a half-hearted dictator, that in many ways she was a much more complex, fleshed-out personality than, let's say, Mr. Modi? Yes. Uh, or Jaya Lalita, or any of the others you mentioned, but particularly Narendra Modi. Uh, there's something very tinny and uh, one-dimensional about him compared to the rich multi-dimensionality of, of, of Indira because she had that love-hate relationship with her father and her father's democratic values, which I think made her a half-hearted dictator. Yes. Uh, she was extremely sensitive to the arts and literature yes. in many, many ways. Uh, she, yeah, I mean, the Wildlife Act was Wildlife preserved Act. in her... Yeah, yeah, and, and she was really quite a towering world personality, and people like Kissinger were actually in awe of her, even even though they hated her guts. So I think there's a uh, there's a complexity and a well-roundedness and multi-dimensionality about Indira Gandhi that makes all these others, her successors, to this day, and particularly in this day, pygmies, mere pygmies. Absolutely, I completely agree with you there. I think that Indira Gandhi. Uh, you know, is a highly complicated and highly fascinating figure. And as you rightly said, you know, among her contemporaries, Golda Meir and Sirima Bhopandran Naika, who were the, uh, the female premiers of the time, uh, she was in the world, like a, she stood out like an exotic bird of paradise. You know, she was, uh, she was uh, tremendously stylish. She had a huge interest in the arts, a tremendous, uh, resonance with Indian heritage, with Indian civilizational <laughs> heritage, you know, the entire conservation movement. I think Indira Gandhi was the only Prime Minister to be head of a bird watching society. Uh, she was actually head of a bird watching society, she was a naturalist, she was a walker, she was a horse rider, she was a very powerful swimmer. She was also, I discovered through the course of the book, an extremely good skier. She could ski very well. So, uh, so her, indeed, her, um, her, uh, her association with the civilizational heritage of India, her determination to uphold the civilizational heritage of India, the kind of uh, intellectuals she cultivated. She herself perhaps was not intellectual in the way her father would have wanted her to be, but she cultivated intellectuals. She invited uh, uh, 
the great thinkers to India. So it was an altogether more cerebral and a more uh, more uh, high culture oriented prime ministership. And I think Mr. Modi, who I think focuses entirely on his own projections to people and how he projects himself. But in that sense, he is perhaps a, a personality cult of the 21st century who uses Twitter, Facebook, uh, you know, Instagram to project himself. I think if Indira Gandhi was uh, in our time, she too probably would be adept at Facebook and Twitter because she was a very good communicator. But at the same time, there was a great deal of depth to her and uh, she was multidimensional and she was in fact someone who uh, who I think brought a great deal more to the Prime Ministership than simply uh, just narrow politics. On the other hand, the kind of politics she played, you know, the problem with Indira Gandhi is that she's a paradox. She's a graceful uh, person of charisma and immense charm. And yet the politics she played is so damaging and so excoriating and so controversial for democratic norms that it's like a paradox, and which is why I keep asking the question that how could someone so graceful and so talented and so multidimensional, Pandaji's daughter, play this kind of politics, this kind of ugly, degraded politics that she played, unfortunately. So it was this paradox. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the poem, I don't know if you would be, but uh, there is this wonderful poem by Tennyson called The Lady of Shalott. Um, do you know it? Yes. You know, the Lady of Shalott, who is mysteriously uh, weaving the loom in her castle. And then, and nobody, and the poem begins very abruptly. Nobody knows why she's weaving the loom. But it's obviously a woman of tremendous grace and charisma, but caged in this castle of her own anger and her own anxieties <laughs> and her own complexes. So she's imprisoned in a castle of her own making, of her own anxieties and insecurities. And yet she's a very graceful, beautiful woman. So, you know, when I finished writing the book, Tennyson's last line, God in his mercy gave her grace, the Lady of Shalott, that kind of came back to me. And I, and I did feel like saying, you know, God in his grace, give, God in his mercy give her grace. Because she was capable of so much, and yet at the end of it, with all that intellectual heft and all that uh, civilizational depth and the heritage and being Pandaji's daughter, tragically, and this happens to be, you know to historical figures, and I think it happens to figures in history who have a gigantic mandate, and perhaps it's true of Mr. Modi as well. You come across a tragic lack of bandwidth. You know, a tragic lack of the inability to really transform India, uh, given the kind of mandate that she had. Okay, uh, we are short on time. I just put in a question here, moving away from the Indira story to sort of your, uh, you know, question on, on democracy in India. And in some ways, uh, most of us here are involved in, for example, questions of technology. And we see them as empowering uh, new forms of democratic participation, sometimes uh, you know, allowing citizens to coordinate responses in crisis. But it seems that it also has this darker side. And, and you've opened us, uh, opened a dialogue about how we need to enrich democracies, and it's not that it works on its own. What kind of things we need to think about as, let's say, people developing apps and developing these platforms? What are, um, for example, do we need to bring you know, some, some radical shift in democracy, or can sort of this party politics adapt to the world of WhatsApp or Twitter? Or what is your reading well, of this whole thing? I think technology has, I think technology plays a fundamental role in deepening democracy. I think as engineers, you know, the, your attempt really should be to bring democracy to as many areas as you can, and to bring democratic participation to as many areas as you can. To, if you take the, you know, if you take the smartphone and you take apps to people who do not have any access to public services, do not have any access to any kind of public utilities, that is a tremendously democratic function. And I think also democracy is deepened, incredibly deepened by access to information. Information is something that that is, uh, is, is a fundamental right and is a birthright of every Indian. And once the Indian is empowered with information, once democracy seeps to the lowest levels where the poorest of the poor are empowered with information, I think then you can really create democratic citizens at the very grassroots. And you can create democratic citizens where democracy is needed. Because unless we create democratic citizens, we will not get democratic leaders. Unless 
we create social democracy, we will not get a political democracy. And the role of technology in furthering the cause of social democracy is huge. Because you can bring information, you can bring utilities, you can bring knowledge, you can bring wisdom through apps, through websites, through startups. You can actually create uh, citizens groups, you can create citizens actions, so much of it can be done through technology. Because unless that social churning takes place, and unless that social questioning takes place, we will not be able to have, we will not get a society which supports the kind of politics we're trying to we're trying to have. We're trying to have a liberal democracy in India, but we don't have the society that can support that liberal democracy because our society is not democratic, because our society, because democracy has not been deepened in our society. So unless we deepen democracy in our society, we're not going to be able to create political democracy. So I think your role is huge. You know, to be able to create, for example, I was very impressed with what I saw, the, the app on the empowerment of women. You know, I think that is fundamental because, empower, you know, empowering women with information, empowering women with the ability to communicate, empowering women with the ease of being technology friendly, I think is a fundamental democratic act because when a woman is empowered, the whole family is empowered. And I think once you empower women, you really can perform a very fundamental, fundamentally democratic role. As with the, you know, I was also very impressed with the work you're doing with the uh, government school uh, kids. You know, again, to bring everyone into the universe of information, to bring everyone into the universe of activism, to bring everyone into the universe of the debate, the chatter. You know, more and more people have to be part of the chatter. Because once you are part of the chatter, that really is what is going to create the democratic journey which will lead to uh, the creation of a political democracy. Uh, I think we have absolutely run out of time. Uh, before I wrap up, let me invite uh, Samesh to give a small audience to us today. He's also a super senior from college. <laughs> so, it'll be a great time. Can you all give a round of applause? It's a great pleasure on oh. behalf of Triple I Delhi. Hey, thank you very much. Small gift. Lovely. Lovely to be here. Oh, was, great. Uh, a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was lovely very to be here. It was lovely thank to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and we have high tea after this. So please join us there. You're all invited.